shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5. I will tell the truth for every lie Proverbs 19 5 A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape Proverbs 19 5 Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one again is called Inquisition Update meets Hour of the Truth and we are continuing our study in the booklet The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. We, that is Joggler 66 from Hour of the Truth and of course Brother in Christ Tom Fress from Inquisition Update over there in the United States of America who I warmly welcome today. Hello Tom, how are you doing? Hello, Yerk. I'm fine, and uh, hello to your listeners, and I hope uh, I hope they glean valuable information from what we're about to speak about. Well, I think uh, that is very valuable information. I just uh, went through the recording we did yesterday because I was producing the video in there, and I think, well, okay, we did not read that many pages yesterday, but on the other hand, the information that we gave our listeners uh, is probably even kind of vital vital to understand in, in many cases and i think that this complete book or this complete little booklet actually is very interesting information and it is actually a mirror of if i can say that it is actually a mirror of your complete mission that you have been doing for more than 10 years now on inquisition yes. update that you have been doing on ham radio that you have been done on uh, that you have been done on uh, amateur radio and all that stuff. And, and this is, you know, this is the thing that, that surprised me a little bit when I got hold of this book in the very first time. I, I flew over it. I read through it. And I thought, this is everything Tom ever said. In yeah. writ. Yeah, it's amazing how God is, uh, is uh, bringing his people together to a common understanding. It's uh, thrilling to be a part of it. An independent part of it, by the way. And... Uh, I'm very pleased to read from other pens and other authors uh, the same things my research has uh, revealed to me. And uh, more specifically, what the Holy Spirit has revealed to me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to see that uh, God speaks to all he has called and chosen. And the message is the same. No contradiction. And uh, I find no contradiction in this book. It's, one it's of, amazing. It's one of the rare cases where you can see a quote-unquote secular writer pinning down what your understanding of the Bible is, right? Yeah. So in the first place, we only have the confirmation of the Word of God, that what we are teaching here is true. And here now we even have someone in the secular world, in this case, the author Paul Owen, who read the first part, the original Futurism and Preterism, also confirming everything that you have said always. Not that you needed that confirmation, because <laughs> you were quite sure you were right, because the more you get attacked, yeah. the more you know you're right, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Well, we're gonna start. I'm gonna start reading on page 20. That is where we uh, where okay. we left it off yesterday. We are we are finishing with the quote from Acts 17 verses 10 through 11. <clears throat> Sorry, the part of the book here uh, here before that was called the Papal Origins of Preterism. Mm -hmm. And now we are starting on page 20. For if you want to read along in your own copy of the book. The Development okay. of Preterism and its Interpretation of the Second Coming of Christ, Section 2. 
Still, this part is written by Paul Owen, and we are dealing most and for all with the preterist view of the prophecy of the revelation or apocalypse, as also often it is called. In addition to the review of the origin preterism and futurism, a few pages should be penned giving clear scriptural authority as to why preterism especially is an aura. Preterism, <coughs> preterism, the author says, especially is an aura. So error. So even compared with futurism, preterism is probably even more in error. Now this will be done, but first a few thoughts as background material. It should be remembered that all viewpoints, be they preterist, be they futurist or even historicist, have the same rule book to play by, the Holy Writ, the Holy Bible, all 66 books. And I want to emphasize at this moment the 1611 authorized King James Version of that sure. book. New manuscripts by Paul or John have not surfaced in Egypt nor has the Vatican brought forth additional writings by Peter. The problem is how one interprets the existing scriptures that have been given to us by God himself. While the writers previously quoted agreed that Rome was responsible for the present-day teaching that all prophecy found in John's book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD or at the fall of pagan Rome, church history reveals traces of this error beginning in the early church age. Now, something that I still don't understand from people who hold on to preterism. They can't even tell whether everything was fulfilled in 70 AD or everything was fulfilled in 410 AD with the fall of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Even here, preterism in itself is not clear in its teaching. And I think this is why the author in the beginning, in the beginning of this reading, he says, as why to preterism especially is an error. Because in preterism they don't even have a stipulated timeline when everything must have had uh, come into fulfillment, whether 70 AD or 410 AD. Even the teachers of preterism <coughs> are not sure about that. Well, if yes. you want to be sure about that, go to the Bible. The Bible is sure, and it's not preterism. I want to draw your attention to this clause at the end here. It says, "It says uh, the book of Revelation was, according to preterism, the book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 A.D. or at the fall of pagan Rome." That's the 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 indecisiveness of uh, or ambiguity to start with with preterism. They can't make up their minds if the Bible prophecies were filled by 70 A.D or by the, by, by the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. And it says, church history reveals traces of this error, preterism, beginning in the early church age. So this verifies what I've been saying all along, that sometimes we give the Jesuits too much credit. Preterism was the teaching in the Roman Catholic Church long before the Jesuits existed. And the Jesuits just dusted off preterism, the ancient teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, and and restated it, giving more apparent evidence, and then launching it off into the Protestant world. Okay? It says, church history reveals traces of this error, future, or rather preterism, beginning in the early church, the early church age. Okay, not long after the day of Pentecost. That's when the church age began. So traces of preterism existed early. Paul talked about a great falling away that would take place. And this, this, that this falling away would have to occur before the man of sin would be revealed. And this is part of the great falling away. We have historical records of traces of preterism, that false interpretation of Bible prophecy, particularly the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, finding its origins early in the church age. And we have to believe also when we get to a further discussion of, of futurism, we're going to discover the same thing. 
These were alternative ways of interpreting the prophecies, which ultimately were used to exonerate the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. So, anyway, that's that's the point I wanted to make. It's it's important. Yeah, Tom, I, I agree. You know, no lie can stand in the light of the truth. That's right. So, when compared to the Bible, preterism as well as futurism both both fall into the ditch. That's right. You only okay. Have... So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the last par the, well, the last paragraph yeah. uh, continues the thought. Actually, the preterists of today can trace some of their dogmas back to the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. So the revival of preterism is nothing new. See? That's what I'm saying. Preterism is nothing new. It's almost as old as the church itself. Okay? It's just as Solomon said, quote, there is no new thing under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. So it, it should become uh, evident that uh, the Jesuits simply dusted off old errors and presented them as though they were new. Okay, back to you then. The upcoming part of the book is going to be very interesting because now we see that the seeds are planted. How and when were the seeds of preterism actually planted? As those apostles and disciples who knew and spoke with Christ after his resurrection began dying off, and Christ had not returned as promised, the thought arose among some of the ecclesiastical leaders in the early centuries that perhaps they had misunderstood. Could there be another explanation as to why Christ had not returned? While the early church quote-unquote fathers as a whole stood fast in the original teaching, there were some who were disappointed and open to further speculation and theory. And that is exactly what preterism is. Speculation, speculation and, and theory. theory. Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> nothing <laughs> else, not based on the true word of God. Yeah. Now, one of those early church fathers who you probably know was Origen, who lived between 185 and 254 AD, who, along with others of the Alexandrian school of theology, was prone to spiritualizing scripture. You just cannot hold a book like this in your hand and read over a sentence where it says Alexandrian School of Theology. What good came ever out of Egypt, I ask you? The Alexandrian School of Theology was of course painted all over with the colors and the dogmas of Egyptian mythology. As to Jesus' second coming, it was spiritual and already past, the author continues to say. Some equated his coming with Pentecost, others to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now can, just, I, can I stop you for a second? Yeah, please. I just wanted to make a short yes, comment on go this. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. When you are equating the coming of Jesus Christ to Pentecost, well, then you except, of course, uh, then you don't accept that at Pentecost the Holy Spirit came, the Comforter who Jesus promised. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, I will come back as the Holy Spirit or whatever, if that was true. But it's not true. He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Comforter who will lead us into all truth. And others even equated to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So you are equating the coming back of the Messiah with the destruction the destruction of Jerusalem instead of the destruction of the whole world of all empires as foretold in Daniel's prophecy. But please, Tom, your comment. Yes, you asked the question you were talking about. Uh, the author actually was writing about this Alexandrian school of theology, and you asked the question, the rhetorical question, what good ever came out of Egypt? And I have to just correct you on one point. Yeah, okay. you're going to find you're you're going to find this interesting. 
Uh, I know what you're getting at. Nothing good ever came out of Egypt the, except one. The Exodus. Except one. Yeah, okay. And no, 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 not even that. Oh. But that counts. That counts. But this is interesting. Uh, you say nothing good ever came out of Egypt, but the Bible describes uh, one one of the prophecies uh, ha- dealing specifically with Jesus says, out of Egypt have I called my son. Yeah, all right. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And this is in reference to the prophetic fulfillment of Jesus and Joseph and Mary who were warned of the angel that Herod sought to pursue Jesus' life and to flee to Egypt and do not return until they until God sent word. And this is simply to fulfill the, pro- the prophecy positively identifying Jesus as the Messiah where the prophet prophesied, out of Egypt have I called my son. There was one good thing that came out of Egypt, and that was Jesus. Okay. All right, back I, to you. I, Just wanted I repent, to throw that in. I repent of a little <laughs> error. <laughs> no need to repent. Just yeah. into, just a little aside information that's very interesting. That's that's true. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I just didn't take that into consideration yeah. that uh, yes. he, as a child, flew to Egypt to get away from yep. the persecution of Herod. That's true. Yep. But for the rest, I think we can agree that no, except certainly. for the Exodus, when the whole people <laughs> of each of the whole people of Israel came out of Egypt, and Jesus a few uh, a few centuries later. As uh, as a child came out of Egypt because the persecution in Judea was gone, nothing else very good came out of that country up to today. Sure. So, by the fourth century A.D., when it was reported that Constantine had converted to Christianity, it became popular to be a Christian. It became popular to be a Christian. <laughs> people, <laughs> people just following. Following the masses, you know, yeah. uh, it's nothing changed in that in that regard. Huh? All mm-hmm. of a sudden, it became popular. When it was reported that Constantine had converted to Christianity, the author says. But when you are a diligent studier of the history, you know that Constantine never really converted to Christianity. That he no. always stayed a pagan until the last breath that he took on this earth. Yeah. But Constantine made Christian Christianity the state religion, which brought about the marriage of church and state. Now this okay. is a Let's very small and insignificant what, what it sentence is, it seems yes, to be, but it is one of the most significant sentences we read here today. Yes. Because Constantine made Christianity the state religion? No. He baptized pagan Rome with Christianity and by that imported all the old quote-unquote gods all the idols of the pagan Roman Empire and gave them Christian names the most popular example of course is when you go today to uh, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican you will see a big statue of Peter that actually was taken from the Pantheon and there bore the name of Jupiter. But I think that Tom has quite a comment on this little sentence that I just Well, read. certainly, um, contrary to what is taught in the churches, Constantine, as you said, remained a pagan all of his life. He worshipped all the gods of the ancient pagan uh, Roman Empire as as is is vividly and and physically displayed in the pantheon uh, in Rome, the pantheon of gods that were worshipped in the Roman Empire. And Constantine just simply lumped Christ into that pantheon of gods. And, uh, and then he made Christianity the state religion, which uh, history records was just an opportunistic uh, act of Constantine to maintain power since since the Christians had turned the world on its head with the gospel of Jesus Christ and more and more people were converting to Christianity to Christ Constantine's attitude was if you can't beat them join them 
or rather, if you can't beat the Christians, simply lump Christ in with all the other gods. And then you have the then you have the assent and the, and the support of all the Roman Empire, whether they be Christian or pagan. And out of that same philosophy, we get the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, can I interrupt Christ? you a little? Uh, yes, just certainly. A second? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. When we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, we read in verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Yeah. Now, why am I reading this? Well, that's because of the tribulation of ten days that are mentioned here by Jesus Christ. When you do a diligent study of the history, you will learn that these ten days, of course, spoken in Bible prophecy, a day is a year, deals with ten years. This is the ten years of severest Christian persecution that took place between 303 and 313 AD. And by that the Roman Empire learned that when they slew hundred Christians, a thousand stood up. When they slew thousand, ten thousand stood up. Christianity just wouldn't die off, even though it was a very, very severe tribulation and a slaughter of the Christians in that time. And right a few years after that, I think in 315, Constantine took over, and Constantine then chose to infiltrate instead of conquer. And that's the same policy the Jesuits have all the time. They also yeah. infiltrated the Protestant churches after the Reformation because they couldn't conquer the Reformation. They couldn't kill it. They tried, right. among others, with the Thirty Year War from 1618 to 48, but it didn't die off. So they really had to infiltrate. And this little passage from uh, Revelation, the words of Jesus Christ himself, are, when you are a diligent studier of the history, you will see that this reports to the three years, uh, 10 years, 303 through 313. And shortly after that, in 321, Constantine made Christianity the state religion. But uh, back to you, Tom. And this is where we get the saying, this is where we get the saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. And uh, that's the Jesuit strategy today, to infiltrate, to counterfeit, to appear to be one of the Protestants, when in fact you're working secretly for the man of sin in Rome. And we have many who call themselves pastors in the Protestant churches are not Protestant at all. They believe the papacy is the vicar of Christ on earth. And though they preach Jesus and him crucified, they worship Satan's man in Rome, the vicar of Christ, they call him. And uh, all of this infiltration of the Protestant churches is, uh, is the Jesuit strategy. And when they, when they brought these these papist pastors into the Protestant churches, uh, they, they, they brought with them the ancient papal teachings of preterism and futur futurism. Thus, within the Protestant churches, actually causing a malignancy that would result in the destruction, the ultimate destruction of Protestantism. Preterism and futurism is the cancer, the terminal cancer of Protestantism. And, and, and all the while they pretend to be uh, uh, ministers of righteousness, when in fact they are ministers of Satan. Difficult words to utter, and I can assure you they are difficult words to hear, by your listeners, but they're true nonetheless. Okay, back to you. Yeah, Tom, the truth is the truth, whether you like it or not. Yeah. As the forerunner likes to say, I haven't heard of him in a while. No. Anyway, as the state church increased in size, power, and wealth, the teachings of Christ and the apostles and disciples faded into the background. 
Now let me ask you, do you see any resemblance of that today? As the church increased in size, power and wealth, who today can compete with the Roman Catholic Church in size, power and wealth? The teachings of Christ and the apostles and disciples faded into the background. The teachings of the reformers of the Protestant churches faded into the background in our days. The more powerful the Roman Catholic Church gets, the more the teachings of Christ and the Reformation faded in the world. And the ecumenical movement was something like the last stroke. This very thing, uh, the church, the the state church, the state church of the Roman Empire was the Roman Catholic Church. That's why it's called the Roman Catholic Church. It's a unit. It's a unity of this church and the state. The church is the spiritual authority of it, and the state is the temporal authority of it. That's why the kings and, commit fornication with the uh, with the whore, right? That's right. That's uh, that's why he reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, now another point I want to bring up this where it talks about the church state increasing in size, power, and wealth, and at the same time the teachings of Christ and the disciples and the apostles faded into the background. In other words, the church took on a life of its own, independent of the teachings of Christ and the apostles and the disciples. And this is given to us in the scripture in the likeness of a parable explaining. It's called the parable of the mustard seed. And when it, now if you understand, if you've done any research, the mustard seed is a very, very small seed. And when it germinates, it grows into a small bush, okay, producing the mustard. It's a very small thing. But in the parable, this mustard seed grows into a huge vining plant that grows to the tops of the trees. And in, this, in the trees, the birds of, of, of the air roost in it. In other words, it has no likeness of a true mustard plant, a small thing, a little bush. It's, it's a chimera. It's a, it's a, a huge abomination. And the birds, of course, of the air that roost in its branches are, are likened unto demons. And it say, says even in the book of Revelation that Mr. Babylon has been a hold for every uh, foul uh, bird, a cage for every hateful, uh, unclean and hateful bird. These are all references to this giant church state that grew out of what is believed to be Christianity. But it's not Christianity. It's counter-Christianity. It is Roman Catholicism. And wherever you see churches demonstrating their power and size and wealth, you find an absence of the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the apostles, and the teachings of the disciples, and you find nothing but carefully devised fables. It becomes a religion unto itself. And who do they choose to be uh, the god of this religion? The papacy the man of sin. And so what early on, before this monstrosity that Constantine created, there were simple little independent Bible churches that were, that were held in people's individual houses. There were no big church buildings, and there were certainly no cathedrals and uh, the gospel spread by word of mouth and by the Holy Spirit, not by a church-state colossus. Now, the Roman Catholic Church cannot impose Roman Catholic canon law, which is the counter of God's holy, eternal, and immutable law, written on stone not once but twice, by the finger of Almighty God himself, 
Rome has her own law. It's called Roman Catholic Canon Law, and it would take an entire library to to read it all. And all these laws that are promulgated by the papacy, by the decrees of the popes, is imposed upon the world by the civil power, by the state. That's why the Bible says he reigns. He, the Antichrist, the papacy, reigns over the kings of the earth reigns over the kingdoms of the earth. And his law, Roman Catholic canon law, becomes the law of every land through the civil power, through the governments of the world, through the kings of the world over which the papacy rules. This is the description of the chimera that comes out of this little mustard seed. And it grows to overwhelming size and power and the demons roost in it, okay? The Bible describes this Roman Catholic Church and the, and the what I have grown to term as Christendom, okay? Now, I'm not preaching against true Bible-believing Christianity. That has lived side by side with this chimera, this gigantic monstrosity that's called Christendom. And Christendom, led by the Pope and the civil authorities of every land, together persecute God's true, independent, spirit-led, Bible-believing church. And this defines all of history, all of prophecy. Prophecy did not end at 70 A.D. The book of Revelation has unfolded throughout the last 2,000 years. But the book of Revelation won't be held in check and silent until the last seven years of time, as believed by the, by the futurists. And it wasn't confined prior to 70 A.D. or the fall of the Roman Empire, according to preterism. The very words of the scriptures and the words of the prophecies have been fulfilled throughout the Christian era, the entire Christian era. The man of sin, the son of perdition, this gigantic church-state union has existed in reality and in history, fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel and John and and Paul for the last 2,000 years. This is the historical, the historicist understanding of the scriptures. It's devoid of understanding in the preterist school of interpretation and the futurist school of interpretation. Literally, the whole history of the church has passed us by if we've been taught preterism or futurism. It's as though God went to sleep. It's 70 AD or the fall of the Roman Empire, and God doesn't wake up again until just before Christ returns. They call it the 70th week of Daniel. It's untenable. The author even uses that word to describe what preterism and futurism propose, untenable. Okay, so the the church state that's talked here about, the state church, that's where Constantine, seeking the political advantage by making Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire, he actually unified state and religion. And they're one cohesive, inseparable union, okay? And that union is even described pictorially on the papal flag. You will find in the papal flag a yellow and and white uh, field, and on the field is a papal tiara, that beehive-looking hat that the Pope wears at his coronation. And beneath that triple-crowned tiara, that the papal that the papacy wears are situated beneath it two keys two keys that are crossed like an x the whole image looks like a skull and a crossbones and that's for a reason too the silver key overlays the golden key and they are bound together with a scarlet colored cord or a golden cord depending on which version of it you see and the, the golden key represents the spiritual authority of the papacy as the vicar or the replacement of Christ. 
and the silver key represents the temporal power of the state. And the two are bound together with a scarlet colored cord, which indicates that if anyone tries to take away from the papacy his temporal power through the state, then there's the shedding of blood. It's going to require the shedding of blood to ever separate the state from the church. So they are permanently bound on a blood oath, a blood covenant. And we know through history that when church and state were separated at the time of the Protestant Reformation, when the governments of the world finally came to the realization that the papacy was the Antichrist of the Bible and, separ and, and, and dispensed with the papal authority, and would no longer respond to the papacy, would no longer impose Roman Catholic canon law by force by the power of the civil governments upon the people, the papacy had no more power in the world. Okay? So it has taken the shedding of blood to reattach those two keys. And that's where we are today. There was bloodshed when the two keys were separated during the Protestant Reformation, when the civil power was stripped from the Pope, there was bloodshed. And now, with the two keys being rebound, there is a bloodshed taking place in the world. That's, this is all defined in history. It's all vividly described in history. It's pictorially de depicted even on the papal flag. And so uh, we can only conclude the papacy is indeed as the historicist demanded, as the historicist universally and unanimously agreed, the papacy and only the papacy could fulfill the role of Antichrist in the world. And, uh, and that's what all true Bible-believing Christians have believed for all, all the way since the early church. And uh, the apostasy that grew out of the early church is, as we know today, the Roman Catholic Church and all of her ecumenical harlot daughters that are seeking to go back into unity with that church, the Roman Catholic Church. All right, I went on a long time with that, but that lays a lot of groundwork that, that your listeners won't get from any church, okay? The, the, these subjects that we're talking about are avoid like the plague in any and every church in existence that I know of today. Back to you, Yerk. What you say it is, uh, or what you think it is safe to say, Tom, uh, the papal flag, as you stated, is yellow on the one hand and white on the other, that that also resembles the gold and the silver? Well, I, I don't know. I've never read, and I would not speculate, but it sounds reasonable to me. Well, you know, you have the, 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 golden, colors, key, the, the golden key who lays on top of the silver key because the yeah. spiritual power is over the temporal power and you have from the left to the right you have the yellow the golden and after that you have the white which could resemble of course uh, the silver just an idea well. because Good. this would be a repetition of that what is uh, then uttered in the keys also right and oh and by the way the another course, yeah, another point that i just wanted to make you can you can directly fall into but um as the state church increased in size, the state church, the state and church combination is something that we shouldn't just read over because this is what makes the fourth beast of the prophecy of Daniel divert from all the others. The combination of state and church. And all the other kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece, before uh, the Holy Roman Empire, even pagan Rome, you had a separation between state and church. You had an emperor and you had a high priest. But in the Roman Catholic Church, these two are combined in one person. Okay, and the point that I wish, wish to make in addition to what I've already said, I've described to you that papal tiara that's on that flag, that beehive-looking hat. On a close inspection, you'll discover that that hat contains three crowns, one near the top, one at the middle, and one near the brim of this uh, beehive looking hat, and it represents uh, Roman Catholic canon law where the pape claims to have power over heaven, that's the top crown, and over earth, 
which is the middle crown, and over hell itself, the, near, the crown near the brim. And uh, the papacy, uh, being God on earth, determines who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And uh, the papacy's so-called power over hell is depicted by, by the Roman Catholic canon law teaching of, of purgatory. And uh, th this is uh, the, how the Roman Catholic Church claims that through the uh, installment of money, you can buy masses to be said for your deceased relatives to get them an early release from the torments of purgatory. So all of these things that are represented in the papal flag are visible in history and visible within the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. The papal flag is just a visual representation of all the abominations of the Roman Catholic Church. First of all, the, pope, the popes assumed uh, control or rulership over heaven, over the earth, and over the underworld, and also the pope's spiritual and temporal power, that is the church and the state, bound together with a scarlet-colored cord. It's all right out in the open, hidden in plain sight for everybody to see. You just need somebody who studied this to tell you what it represents. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, so the state church began to teach that surely Christ had already come, and the church actually was the kingdom. Now, who needed Paul's admonition that we can read of in Titus 2, verse 13, quote, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Centuries passed, and in the Middle Ages, when Rome was at its height of power, a literal coming of Jesus would have been an embarrassment to the quote-unquote church. They were doing quite well, thank you. They controlled the ecclesiastical world as well as the political and had no need of Christ. They were already in the millennium, ruling and reigning with Christ. Why would they think otherwise? They had control of it all. That's right. That's the old world order. That was the old world order. The church and state were hermetically united. The church ruled supreme over the state. The state imposed Roman Catholic canon law upon the Roman world. And they had no need for Christ. They had all the power. They were simply uh, exercising their prerogatives in this new Christian global religion under the authority of the Pope. You see how the papacy has literally replaced Christ on the earth? He's both the spiritual and the temporal power. He, he declares when one goes to heaven and when one goes to hell. He reigns over the kings of the earth. The, the kings of the earth do his bidding and impose his law upon God's people. That's the old world order. It was overthrown at the Protestant Reformation. Now, since, pre since Protestantism has repudiated its belief that the papacy is the man of sin, the son of perdition, then it's up now to the once called Protestants to restore to the papacy what was lost at the time of the Protestant Reformation. That's why the United States and England and former Protestant nations are fighting the wars to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. We are restoring the old world order. That's what they call the new world order. What they mean when they use the term the new world order is literally post-Protestantism. Rome has no more opposition. The Protestants have committed suicide have immolated themselves by believing in futurism and preterism and thereby exonerating the papacy of the onus of Antichrist. And so now we're in a period of restoration, making amends for the Protestant Reformation, restoring the Pope to the dignity, the power, the wealth, and authority that he had before the Protestant Reformation, literally creating a new world order that is a mirror image of the old. That's it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, when the author says here they were already in the millennium, ruling and reigning with Christ, where was their Christ? The Pope, who calls himself the replacement of Christ on earth. 
-hmm. He ruled the church, and you know the motto of the Jesuits, the church to rule the world, the Pope to rule the church, and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Why would they even think otherwise? They had control of it all until the Reformation came. It's a matter of timing. As the reader may have noted, it was and still is a matter of timing. Man's timing was out of sync with God's eternal plan. Yeah, it always has been out of sync with God's eternal plan. The lack of understanding of God's timing has often led men into many blind alleys. Although Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 3 verse 8 to, quote, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, unquote. It is difficult for us mortals to comprehend that God does not live in time as we do. The problem with timing occurs not only with the second coming, but also with all historical events in scripture. One example. The manifestation of the kingdom. Most Christians believe in the kingdom, but it is spiritual. Literal? But is it spiritual? Is it literal? Or is it both? Is it present now, or to be set up as Christ's second coming? This small booklet will not attempt to examine the many answers that individuals give to those questions, but it will provide those clues that exist within the scriptures regarding the second coming. Like every time, when you have a question about something of the Bible, where do you go to? Not to man, the go Bible. to the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> all, ans all answers will be found in the Word of God. Now, even in Paul's day, there were those who were off in their timing and understanding of the resurrection. Paul scourges Hermeneus and Philetus with the following words that we can read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. Quote, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Unquote. Preterism's progressive course, the author continues, on page 23, and now it gets very interesting because we are reading some errors and events in a moment. During the early centuries, when the spiritualization of scripture had secured a firm footing, other errors began to creep in. To creep in. Error begets more error. Well, I think <laughs> we all understand that when we look around in Certainly. our world today, right? We can all understand that. One error begets another one. Because for one lie to sustain, if it starts to shake you have to put two lies under it to sustain it. Mm -hmm. And when they that's start right. to shake, the same needs two again. So that's already four. And that's another right. eight. And another sixteen. And so on. And so In on. In other words, error breeds like bunnies. Yeah, or like cancer. Yep, that's right. And that's uh, the point that Paul was making here. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Yep. So, during the early centuries, when spiritualization of scripture had secured a firm footing, other errors began to creep in. Error begets more error, as we just in, uh, stated. Some of those errors that took hold in the church and the events that took place subsequent to those errors led progressively to a state church. A few of these errors and events are shown below, and we are going to read first three different errors. Error number one. Christ returned spiritually, either at Pentecost or at 70 AD, at the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore, we must be in the kingdom now. The church is the kingdom. Okay. This means the Roman Catholic Church is the kingdom. That's the error that is believed today. That's what the papacy has said in their interpretation of Bible prophecy according to the preterist school of interpretation, the Antichrist was done away with in 70 AD or at the fall of the Roman Empire. The papacy immediately came to power at that time, and we've been living in the millennium ever since. 
under the vicar of Christ. This is the millennial kingdom of Christ under the Pope. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches in her preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just uh, thinking about where Ken read it. It said, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it said in John 16 or something, uh, when uh, Jesus uh, ascends uh, uh, up to heaven, and um, the people say, uh, what are you Jews looking up? The same Jesus that you see going up to heaven comes down in the same way. I thought yeah. it was John, John 16. I'm not uh, quite sure. Um, but uh, the point is that we can read that. And, and there, of course, Tom, I think is the first <clears throat> very big error in what I just read. Because it says Christ returned spiritually. But the Bible never speaks about Christ returning spiritually. The Bible only speaks about Christ being replaced spiritually by the Holy Spirit until right. his second coming. And even That's Jesus right. himself said that every eye will see him coming. That's right. So this is absolute nonsense to believe an error that builds on the presumption that Christ returns spiritually because every yeah. word in the Bible contradicts that. Yeah. But let's go on Agreed. to the second error. The promises made to Israel in the Old Testament are of a spiritual nature. Therefore, they find their fulfillment in the quote unquote church. The third error is the millennium has arrived. Therefore, we are ruling and reigning with Christ. Having the Pope the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, as the vicar of Christ. Those are the three identified errors. Now, what to the events? First event. Once pagan ruler Constantine converted to Christianity and declared Christianity to be the state religion. Well, we already established that Constantine never converted to I, I would like to call it biblical Christianity. He may be converted to a kind of Christianity. Well, that's the same kind as the Roman Catholic Church calls itself Christian. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the church and state married. The second event goes on. And as time passed, the church assumed more and more power and wealth. And the third event goes that this state church began teaching the foregoing spiritual interpretation as truth. And they believed it was their duty to teach these precepts to all nations and to stamp out all error and unbelief wherever found. That's this right. is and that's... the mentioning this is the mentioning of the Inquisition. Yep. To stamp out all error and unbelief wherever found. To call anyone who does not adhere to Roman Catholic canon law a heretic and to take away all his rights, all his possessions, and even his life. Do you have any comments so far, Tom? Nope. Nope, you covered it pretty good. Okay. Great. Any knowledgeable Christian should at once recognize these progressive steps as the history of the Roman Catholic Church. There's a the problem. very important sentence, I'm sorry, I'm a very important <laughs> sentence, because the problem is every knowledgeable Christian should recognize these progressive steps as the history of the Roman Catholic Church, if only every knowledgeable Christian cared for the study of history. That's right. Because what the Jesuits and what the Roman Catholic Church in the very first place does is omit, twist, falsify history that you cannot see the history of the roman catholic church because if you do the author is completely right we should all recognize these progressive steps steps as the history of the roman catholic church if we are presented with true traceable history where we can trace that down but please don't your comment well in the Protestant churches early on in the Protestant Reformation, the parishioners, those who attended the Protestant churches, were constantly reminded about the diabolical history of the Catholic Church. 
they reinforced why they left the Roman Catholic Church. They enumerated all the atrocities, all the wars, all the crusades against the godly Bible-believing Christians like the Waldenses and the Huguenots and the Hussites and the Lollards and all of those who maintained always that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. They enumerated those things. People studied the book of Fox's Book of Martyrs, where it traces Rome's persecution throughout the centuries of God's people. But those things are not talked about in the churches anymore. No one is reminded of the ancient horrors and atrocities of the Roman Catholic Church. No one is reminded of the diabolical lives of the popes. No one is reminded of how hideous Roman Catholic canon law is. Nobody is reminded what a tyrant the papacy was and what a brutal beast the civil governments were that imposed Roman Catholic canon law on the people. Nobody is reminded of the untold millions of martyrs that were suffered for their belief in Jesus and him alone, in faith, in Christ alone, in the scriptures alone, and how the states under papal authority executed them in organized, systematic fashion. Those things are just too ugly to talk about in the churches today. It says any knowledgeable Christian, that now you know what the knowledge he's talking about is. <laughs> any knowledgeable Christian should at once instantly recognize these progressive steps as the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, look, unless I enumerated for the next three months every atrocity that was ever committed by a pope or by his prelates or by the state governments underneath their authority, it would be the first time your listeners would hear of the bloody diabolical history of the Roman Catholic Church, and they most likely wouldn't believe it. So I'll spare them. And if the Holy Spirit leads them in the direction of seeing it for themselves, there is limitless access to that information on the Internet today. As long as we have that access, Tom. As long as we have that access, that's correct. And if, 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 if the people would only at least give credence to this, that Tom's talking about something I've never heard of before. Maybe I should check it out. Let the Holy Spirit guide and direct and let him lead you into all truth, a truth that has been carefully and systematically and for nearly 2,000 years kept a secret when it was even in front of your face. The wars of the world today go on before the cameras of the world and no one perceives them for what they are. That's how deeply pap the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church has hidden their diabolical activities in the world. Any knowledgeable Christian should at once recognize these progressive steps, the union of church and state, the, the, the granting of the, the kingdom of God to the Pope, spiritualizing the second coming of Christ, all of these things are rooted in the Roman Catholic Church. All of these errors are found in the Roman Catholic Church. And unless we know the history of the Roman Catholic Church, there's no way we can believe such things. But uh, the, the information is there. If you have the desire, if the Holy Spirit leads you to find it, you will find it. He that seeketh findeth. Go ahead, Yerk. It's wonderful that you cite the Holy Spirit here, Tom, because in John 16, verse 13, we read Jesus speaking, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Right. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, you have to be born again. 
and you can only be born again when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and repent of your sins and accept that he died for you on the cross 2,000 years ago as predicted by Daniel in Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27. When you adhere to the false teaching of Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27, you cannot be saved. You cannot have the Holy Spirit in you. You will not be led to any truth, but you will led into perdition. Because you rather adhere to the word of man than the word of God. I'm sorry, I have to say it this frankly, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. This is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, people. The origin of futurism and preterism, this little booklet that we have read now for 23 pages, shows us how conniving the devil who is transformed into an angel of light works. And when you do not receive the true spirit of God, you will receive a false spirit. Mm -hmm. On page 24, the author continues, an in-depth look at church and secular history will reveal the inevitability that any church group or organization that follows these progressive steps and erroneous precepts will eventually terminate in a state or world church. While all Christians earnestly yearn for God's kingdom to rule the earth, knowledgeable Christians recognize that until the king returns and those who will rule with him are incorruptible, there can be no righteous ruling and reigning. So when you understand that until the king returns, the prince of peace, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, there can be no righteous ruling and reigning, why are you going to the ballot and cast your quote-unquote voice, whether to the right wing or to the left wing of the politics that is just a game by the Antichrist? That's right. You're only voting for the state wing of the church. Church and state are united. All the candidates for presidency, whether they be of the left or the right, are candidates of the Roman church state. And they serve the church. Or they're done away with. Somehow they're involved in some scandal or they're executed, assassinated, or they come down with incurable disease. But no matter who you vote for at the polls, they can't rise to the level of a candidate unless they have sworn an allegiance to the papacy. Their first allegiance is to this so-called vicar of Christ, this self-styled vicar of Christ. The new world order is simply the reestablishment of the old world order. And they know their lives depend upon how well they serve their master in Rome and how well they serve him by disguising who it is they actually work for. You're always frustrated every time you go to the poll. The presidential candidate for whom you vote never fulfills his promises. Why is that? Now, all of a sudden, it makes sense, doesn't it? He doesn't serve you. He says he does, but you would believe a lie if you believed him. He serves the same one that the kings of the earth served during the old world order. And he knows that if he betrays his master in Rome, he's toast. And nobody will even go to jail for it. Take the case of President John F. Kennedy. Take the case of Abraham Lincoln. Take the case of all of the assassinated presidents of the United States. And you will find that they betrayed the papacy in one form or another, and they were outed. They were assassinated by the, by the emissaries of Rome. 
any politician that rises to the higher ranks of rulership in this country comes to grips with the reality who they must serve to be successful in politics, whether they be on the left or the right, it doesn't matter. But Tom, how can you say that? The president takes an oath. He puts his hand on the Bible and he swears that he will Roman defend Catholic, the country. <laughs> Roman Catholic canon law, Roman Catholic canon law stipulates that if any Roman Catholic swears an oath contrary to the teachings of the church, he has committed a perjury and he is exempt from that oath. So they can literally swear on a stack of Bibles anything they want to. If it goes against the church, they are ipso facto exonerated as having has as having committed nothing more than perjury. And also another point is that they can always um, retreat to um, mental reservation. Yes. Because the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. And if the church in the end is the gainer, they can swear anything they want. Now, the interesting question that we can ask here, why are they swearing in the first place when the Bible says not to swear? Not on anything that is in heaven or in the earth, but let your nay be nay and your yea be yea. That's right. <laughs> and anything more, anything more cometh of evil. Yeah. Doesn't it? Exactly. So every oath binds you against Christ. That's what it's literally saying. If you're forced to take an oath, then you're forced to swear against Christ. Even though you say you swear your oath in God's name or on his Bible. If you're forced to swear an oath to occupy an office, you have committed sin against the Lord. So it's just the way it is. We can identify any organization, political or otherwise, if it's bound by an oath, it's not of Christ. Have any of you sworn an oath? I think any Freemasons out I, there have sworn an oath? <laughs> Thanks, I just wanted to say that. I Are th there anybody listening <laughs> that, that went into a Masonic lodge professing Christianity and then were forced to swear? I wish to come out of the darkness and into the light of Freemasonry. What have you just said about your Christ? That he's darkness. And you wish to come into the light of Freemasonry. And then you are given an oath to swear. It's the same in every organization. You bind yourself to an oath given by man and you have sworn allegiance to man and you have rejected Christ. Christ gives the specific clear language swear not at all. That ought to send some heads reeling. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Yerk. Yeah, I just want to read the essence of the last sentence that we just read before continuing with the last paragraph on page 24 of this book. The essence of that sentence, sentence reads easily, Until the king returns, there can be no righteous ruling and reigning. It is of interest that the early church had one sword, the sword of the Spirit, and did very well. But in less than 300 years, by prayer, preaching, teaching and witnessing, they had won so much of the populace to Christ, from slave and peasant to those of Caesar's household even, that the pagan state wanted to join them. Unfortunately, the state churches, by whatever name, attempted to use two swords. The sword of the spirit plus the sword of the magistrate. As Tom said the silver and the golden key of the papacy. Yep. History would seem to indicate that this combination is not nearly as effective spiritually 
as those who used but the one sword, the sword of the Spirit. See, the Roman Catholic Church didn't learn anything from the old ancient pagan Roman Empire. The pagan Roman Empire had not the sword of the Spirit. All they had was the iron sword to lop off people's heads. And they lopped off Christians' heads by the thousands. They entertained themselves by throwing Christians to the lions. They entertained themselves by burning Christians on crosses. And what has the Holy Roman Empire done any differently? That's why they're one and the same. Nothing has changed. There's nothing new under the sun. You see what I've said all along? The Bible made it absolutely impossible to miss Jesus when he came. Does any of us think that since God went to such great length in the Scriptures to identify his Son and given us a timeline precisely when he would come, Daniel's 70th week, Does it make any sense to you anymore to believe that God kept the identity of the Antichrist a secret? Why would God send his son to die for us, give us the precise timing of his coming in Daniel's prophecy, give us the very words that he would utter on the cross, give us that he was the only human if I could use the term, that was born of a virgin, that was called out of Egypt, that caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that was wounded in his hands and his feet and his side, that was born in the city of Bethlehem, in the city of David, Bethlehem Ephrata, that he was named God with us, that God made it so impossible to miss who Jesus Christ was, why would he play so treacherously with the ones, the souls of for whom Christ died and bled to save and keep it a secret from us who the Antichrist is? That's what you've been taught to believe in your churches. God made it just as obvious to us who the Antichrist is as he made it obvious to us who his son was. Stop saying that you no longer know who, you don't know who the Antichrist is. To say that you don't know who the Antichrist is, or that he came back in 70 A.D. or 410 A.D., or that the Antichrist won't come until the last seven years before Christ's return, is to say that God deals treacherously with the souls and the salvation of those he sent his own son to bleed and die for just as surely as we can proclaim Jesus the Christ, we can just as surely say the papacy is the Antichrist. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. Um, we are going to read now on page 25 the next part of the book that is called Christ's Second Coming and Unfulfilled Prophecies. A significant error and the scriptural responses to that error are found below. Some preterists believe that although Christ did come at Pentecost in 33 AD um, and 70 AD, he will make a final appearance at the end of the world age. Others strongly maintain that his second appearance was a spiritual one in 70 AD and that is the end of it. Please note that the following scriptures are very clear and not limited to one or two obscure verses that might easily be interpreted as one wished. The authors <clears throat> are of the highest caliber who were honest, godly men filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke, John and Paul. Please read carefully and prayerfully. But before I go into the different citations of the Bible that follow now on the next few pages, we are going to have a little break and we'll postpone this part to the next reading where Tom and I meet together. We just take a little break and we'll put this little recording into two parts and then we will continue the reading The Origins of Futurism 
and preterism. So I'll be seeing Tom in a few minutes, and I'll be seeing you with the next broadcast on Inquisition Update meets Hour of the Truth. Until then, Jogler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off, saying God bless you. Bye-bye.